How's it going, everybody? So as promised, today we'll be continuing our deep dive into the history of land crocs. In the last episode, we talked about how the first crocodiles actually started out as terrestrial archosaurs and grew to be the top predators in the bizarre world of Triassic Pangaea. And despite the fact that some of them would switch to the semi-aquatic lifestyle we associate them with today by the end of the period, others would remain on land. And from there, they would go in all kinds of crazy evolutionary directions. They survived the extinctions at the end of the Triassic, Cretaceous, and Eocene. Well, they barely survived the last one, but they still did. And then the last of them finally ran out of steam around 12 million years ago, giving rise to some truly amazing animals along the way. If you haven't seen part one yet, I definitely recommend checking it out. That way you're all caught up with the first 238 million years of this story. But now it's time to move on to the next chapter. And for that, we have to travel to Pleistocene Australia. So let's get into the Southlands terrestrial crocodiles. It may just shock you how close this group actually came to being just another kind of crocodile that we think of here in modern times. Wait, what about the boar croc? No, Tim Tim, we're not talking about the boar croc today. But the boar croc is the animal that you showed everyone a picture of and got everybody all curious about land crocs in the first place. You have to talk about the boar croc. <sighs> I hate you. Fine, let's briefly cover that first. So, as the annoying little thing that watches me sleep at night has pointed out, in the last episode, I did not talk about the boar croc also known as Caprosuchus. You may know this creature if you've ever played the game Ark Survival Evolved. And if you ever have, and if you're foolish enough to have ever been running around the swamps of that game, that is just one of the many unpleasant things you may encounter. Or you might know this creature from the one time when it was shown, terribly I might add, in the popular British show from the early 2000s, Primeval. Because of this, out of all the terrestrial crocodile forms that have ever existed, this is the one that most people are going to be familiar with. So why didn't I bring it up then? Well, the main reason is that despite this animal's notoriety, we actually don't have a ton of evidence to suggest that this was a terrestrial crocodile. For starters, we have exactly one fossil of Caprosuchus. This one skull. And I know that we technically only have that for the giant Barinosuchus that I talked about last time, but the difference is, we have a lot more close relatives to compare that one to. The Sebekids are entirely a terrestrial group of archosaurs. And what we do have of Barinosuchus shows similarities to its cousins. Like the general skull shape and those same flat blade-like teeth that we have seen time and time again in Land Crocs. The skull of Sebekids are deep and narrow not flat and broad from side to side like what we see in crocodiles today. Even gharials, which don't have very wide snouts, still don't have deep ones either. This is because a vertically deep skull would be poor for moving quickly from side to side in the water. It would just create too much drag. But now, getting back to the skull of the boar croc, it's actually pretty confusing. From this one fossil, we can tell that this animal had a broad head like an aquatic crocodile but the position of the eye orbits and the horns on the back of the skull would have made it difficult for the animal to stay hidden in the water when it's stalking its prey, like we see classic crocodilians do. It has nostrils on top of its skull, which is a trait that you would think would be useful for breathing on the surface of the water, and its teeth are the most confusing of all, because these teeth don't really fit with the short conical teeth for grabbing and holding prey like aquatic crocodiles, nor do they match the flat blade-like teeth of land crocs. So basically, I bypassed this animal because despite it being from the Mesozoic, we don't actually know one way or another whether this animal was terrestrial, aquatic, or something in between. Maybe I'll do a Paleo Catalog Basics video about this guy someday, but for now, the point is I did not cover this animal in the history of land crocs because we don't actually know much about it. There's enough evidence from this one skull pointing in both directions to say absolutely nothing with any real certainty. So getting back on subject, we now have to travel to Australia and the islands of Southeast Asia. And to give a little bit of context, we should probably go back a little bit as well. Because to give the full story of the last group of the land crocs, we have to start in the Eocene and Oligocene. 
If you remember, this is when the great forests were starting to disappear across the world. This would spell doom for the Planocranids in the Northern Hemisphere, and although this would eventually come to affect the South in the same way, the rainforest collapse was not as immediate in Australia and South America. This is what allowed the Sebekids to hang on in South America a little bit longer. And Australia in particular remained tropical throughout this epoch. And in this tropical oasis, the ancestors of the weird and wonderful animals of the land down under started down the path that would eventually lead to what we know today. Animals like Palarchestes, the marsupial we've talked about before, which, despite being in no way related, was a clawed, browsing herbivore similar to ground sloths in the Americas. It was in these Australian jungles that the last tale of the land crocs was set to begin. It would start off with the branching of an unassuming group of crocodilians called the Mikosukids. This was a group of aquatic crocodiles, not unlike what we know today. In fact, they're actually closer related to true crocodiles than alligators are. But at this point is when some members of this group would start to go in a different direction, abandoning the aquatic predator role for a new life on dry land. Although these animals would not have as erect of a posture as the Sebekids or the Planocranids, this group would evolve longer legs than what is typical or necessary for aquatic living. They may have had a stance and gait somewhat comparable to monitor lizards. They started out as mid-sized carnivores with Quincana maboli and Mycosuchus whitehuntensis, likely taking advantage of the roles not yet being filled by mammals. There were mammalian predators, but they remained smaller and mostly arboreal, like Wakaleo. So this once again gave the crocs the opening that they needed. These reptiles would once again switch to the blade-like teeth that we see in other crocodile forms who adopt this lifestyle. But even from here, these two Australian species would eventually go in very different directions, as the Australian rainforest started to recede. One would take advantage of the ebb and flow of the coastlines in the Indo-Pacific Islands and spread to colonize new lands, and the other would remain on the Australian mainland, and grow to become one of the most feared predators on the continent. As we go into the Miocene, Pliocene, and into the Pleistocene, Australia goes through a gradual period of drying, eventually replacing the tropical forests across much of the continent with sparse dry woodland. This led to the same evolutionary pressures as it did in other areas of the world, where herbivores become larger and more well adapted for moving quickly across more open terrain, and the carnivores basically following suit. But there were no hoofed ungulates in Australia. Instead, we see animals like the macropods filling the same niche. They would become the fastest grazers on the continent along with the tall treetop browsers. And then we have the diprotodontids filling the role of the large-bodied mid-level browsers. There were even relatives of the echidna that got to be the size of sheep. And the predators had become truly impressive to be able to hunt these new kinds of prey. The small Wakaleo from the Oligocene had grown into the jaguar-sized Thylacaleo carnifex. This was the largest carnivorous mammal on the continent. And it would have been the undisputed king, had mammals been as dominant here as they were just about everywhere else during the Pleistocene. But since this video is about land crocs, I'm pretty sure you know where I'm going with this. By the Pleistocene, the two-meter-long Quincana maboli had nearly tripled in size and become Quincana fortirostrum. And even this six-meter-long monster was not alone, because there was another dragon in the outback that likely competed with the Quincana directly, the large monitor lizard Varanus priscus, better known as Megalania. Although the lizard's maximum size is somewhat debated, the upper estimates suggest that it may have been up to 7 meters long. The presence of these beasts implies that Australia was still very much a land ruled by reptiles, at least when you look at the apex predators. Don't forget, by this time, the saltwater crocodile had also moved into the role of aquatic hunter as well. It's thought that these three giant predators were able to live together because they lived in different environments. We already know that salties prefer rivers, billabongs, and estuaries, and Megalania may have preferred more open, arid bush like many surviving Australian monitors, and Quincana may have occupied denser forests, or stuck close to the waterways without directly competing with the more aquatic saltwater crocodiles. These three reptiles and one mammal super predator seem to have a pretty good understanding going. 
But the one thing that they probably didn't need was another apex predator. But in this strange land, we humans would encounter all four of these animals around 60,000 years ago. This would be the first and last time that our species would encounter a giant land croc. And it's unknown what level of impact our presence actually had on these animals. For one thing, it was around this time that the drying out of Australia started to result in the desertification that may have destroyed the habitat these guys relied on. We may have indirectly hunted them out by overhunting the different prey species, or we may have actually further exacerbated the loss of the forests that were left by burning to clear land. But there is currently no evidence that we actually hunted Quincana or Megalania ourselves. If anything, when considering the weapons of the time, it's actually far more likely that we would have fallen prey to them rather than the other way around. But regardless of the exact cause, by around 40,000 years ago, most of the megafauna, whether they be reptile, mammal, or bird, had been wiped out. But even still, there was one lineage that was still hanging on in the islands across the Indo-Pacific. And some actually theorize that these guys actually took the body plan of the land croc to all new heights. Literally. As the glaciers receded in the northern hemisphere with the end of the last ice age, the sea levels began to rise. And with that, it became more difficult to travel in between the Indo-Pacific Islands. This isolated the Mikosukids on different islands and made them evolve into separate species. Unlike the ones that remained on the mainland, these guys stayed small at around 1 to 2 meters. There were two species of known Mikosukis that survived into the Holocene. The one called Mikosuchus inexpectus lived on New Caledonia and had teeth that were specialized for crushing. This is believed to have been used to feed on crustaceans. And the other species, called Mikosuchus calpocasi, lived on Vanuatu. Despite these being the only two confirmed Mikosuchids that we know for sure survived after the last ice age, there is still a chance that more species on different island chains have yet to be identified. For example, there is one unnamed species of Mikasukid that survived in New Zealand during the Miocene. So there may have been many different tiny island land crocs all throughout Oceania. Another intriguing possibility is that in response to getting smaller and living in rainforest habitats, both of these species of Mikasukids may have been arboreal. They seem to do particularly well on the island chains where mammals never gained a foothold at all. New Caledonia in particular had a staggering number of unique bird and reptiles that lived alongside Mikosuchus. But unfortunately, one thing that we have seen countless times from island habitats is that they are particularly susceptible to invasive species. This last home of the land crocs remained hidden until just around 3,000 years ago, when humans finally arrived. And when that happened, it was only a matter of time. This time, Overhunting was more than likely directly to blame. And not just overhunting their prey either. There's actually been evidence to suggest that humans may have even fed on these reptiles directly. But in addition, habitat loss and other invasive species that humans brought with them like rats and dogs probably all played a factor in the collapse of the biosphere of New Caledonia. These animals were not just the last of the Mikosukids. They were the last branch of reptiles to adopt this way of life that had been just as big a part of crocodile evolution as their relationship to the water. The entire reason why I made these videos was because of how intrigued many people were by the idea of a terrestrial crocodile. Almost like it was some kind of novel idea. But the truth is, up until around 30 centuries ago, there was some kind of land croc on Earth for the entire time that there were amphibious ones around. Hell, technically, the land crocs actually came first, and now they're forgotten to the point where most people never even knew they existed. I mean, look at it this way. When we were talking about species as recent as the ones on New Caledonia, you're talking about animals that you can actually find non-mineralized bone remains of. These are not fossils, 
these are actual bones. Like, these guys were very close to being a thing that we could have seen Steve Irwin making a show about in the 90s. And that's really unfortunate. Because I think the idea of being able to go to a far-off island and see a three-foot croc with a short stout laying in a tree like an iguana would be really cool. But instead, it's up to people like me to inform you that such amazing animals once existed. If you enjoyed this video, as well as the last, don't forget to leave a like, and subscribe if you want to learn more about the forgotten chapters of our planet story. I've already gotten a ton of great comments that have given me so many ideas for future videos, but keep them coming. Any questions, specific species for catalogs, groups of animals to, for a video like this, or anything else Pilia related, all of it could be the next big video project idea for me. And if you want to support the channel further, now you can join me on Patreon and start to see a little bit more of the behind the scenes of what's going on. I'm actually working on some pretty cool things that I'll be adding in the future, but I don't want to give anything away just yet. Anyway, see you all in the next one. Bye.